My name is Robin Carpenter, and I'm the moderator for the symposium tonight. I am a writer and a journalist, uh, especially specializing in food and food justice issues. And the past several years, I've spent a lot of time writing about GMOs and about the people that you're going to meet tonight. Um, first of all, we want to thank the sponsors and the people that made tonight possible. I've never met anyone in my life who can hold so much data and so much information and say it in a way that's fascinating, succinct, and totally makes sense. Because this is a challenging issue. Uh, GMOs and the technology around this, it's complex, it's complicated, understanding all these different issues, and Jeffrey has a way of knowing exactly how and when to say what piece of data, and he's a great teacher at it too. He is the leading consumer advocate promoting a, a healthier non-GMO life. He's the director of the Institute for Responsible Technology, and his first book, Seeds of Deception, which I love the subtitle, Exposing Industry and Government Lies About the Safety of the Genetically Engineered Foods You're Eating. It's a, a wonderful book, and it's a, it's a great first book. And Jeffrey, we're so thrilled to have you here again today and doing all the work that you're doing to make this change happen. Hello again, Marin. I come to Marin a lot because my brother's here. Hi, Rick. <laughs> And uh, it feels like a second home. And uh, I've often tried to actually move here for months at a time, but I couldn't find a, a house-sitting situation. But I'll, I'll get there eventually. Maybe when I put myself out of a job this year, I'll, I can retire here. Uh, how many of you would like to see labels on genetically modified foods? Raise your hand. OK. Let's give applause for that, OK? All right, how many of you do not want to see labels on genetically modified foods? Look around for the Monsanto plant. How many have not yet, not yet decided? How many don't like raising their hand? <laughs> All right. <laughs> what I'm going to do is I'm going to share a personal story and give a talk that I've never given before. And it's going to track my personal messaging progress and also what I'm seeing reflected in the change in collective consciousness re regarding GMOs. I've been working on this issue since 1996, when I heard a scientist describe the scientific reasons why genetically engineered foods could be an unprecedented catastrophe. We talked about the self-propagating genetic pollution that can outlast the effects of global warming and nuclear waste and how the products of this infant science, this faulty technology, are being fed to everyone who eats. And so over the few years of my local activism, I decided to create a strategy to get through the noise, to get people interested in GMOs where most people had never heard of them and did not want to read a scientific book. And by 2002, there were some terrific stories. If you haven't not been involved in the actual story, the story of Dr. Arpad Puztai, who was fired from his job and stripped of responsibilities and gagged when he discovered how dangerous genetically modified food was. Or Ignacio Cipella from UC Berkeley, who was about to release research on how the indigenous corn varieties in Mexico had been contaminated with genetically modified corn, but had been summoned by a senior Mexican government official who, Ignacio told me, threatened him, implying we know where your children go to school, trying to get him not to publish the evidence. How Fox TV reporters from a Tampa news station were about to release a four-part news series on Monsanto's bovine growth hormone and its link to cancer. <clears throat> but three days before the news series ran, an attorney from Monsanto wrote a letter to Fox corporate headquarters. So they stopped it, reviewed it, it passed the review, it was rescheduled, a new letter was written promising dire consequences to Fox or Rupert Murdoch 
by Monsanto if they ran this four-part news series, and it was ultimately canceled. We described how in, this, in the book that I was envisioning, it was going to be stories that were going to be emotionally impactful. So I was looking for hooks of stories. So in one chapter, it was about a woman with incredible pain, which was typical of those with EMS, eosinophilia myalgia syndrome, a disease created by genetically modified L-tryptophan. And yet the FDA hid that information from Congress and from the general public in order to protect the reputation of biotechnology. So by 2002, I had been accumulating these stories, and my focus was on waking people awake, waking people up about GMOs by giving the story hook. So they didn't have to be concerned about GMOs in the beginning, but they wanted to start a book and get caught into what happened to Dr. Arpad Pustai by the end of the chapter, and then, they, then talking about the outrage and the, the horrific treatment of truth and science and integrity at the hands of the biotechnology companies and their enforcement wing, the FDA. So the first round of my travels was with Seeds of Deception, and it became the world's best-selling book on the subject because that particular formula at that particular time was a good fit. And as I went around the world, in the end of the book, actually, I promised, or I said I would, I didn't quote promise, but I told everyone that I was going to write another book about the environment using the same story format. But when I traveled around the world with seeds of deception, giving it to cabinet ministers and senators and congressmen, I gave it to them and I realized they'll never read the book because they don't have the time. They need quick reference material. We got lucky in Vermont when a co-op gave a copy of Seeds of Deception to every member of the legislature and they were looking at the first state legislation on GMOs and a person actually did a master's thesis on the impact of the book and it turns out it was pivotal in that case. People started reading it, they said they couldn't put it down because the stories stuck and they read the whole book and it changed their vote and it was very helpful. But in general, Seeds of Deception was basically, I, it was very interesting. I remember going to the world, the WTO in Cancun and I'd meet these ministers of finance and ministers of trade and from Africa and all over the world and I'd give them the book and I would say, it turns out that genetically engineered foods aren't safe and they were put on the market based on industry manipulation and political collusion. And they'd go, yeah, that makes sense. And, and then they'd ask me to sign it. <laughs> and then they'd put it away. And so um, I realized I didn't want to write the next book because what I was doing is I was traveling around the world. I was interviewing the campaigners in 25 countries and in most states asking them, what are you doing on GMOs? What is working and what is not? And I realized, even more than I had before, that we had the most powerful strategy in hand already occurred in Europe. When Arpad Pustai's gag order was lifted on February 16, 1999, a firestorm of media turned GMOs into a marketing liability within 10 weeks. Unilever publicly committed to stop using GM ingredients in its European brands by the end of April. Earlier that year, in January, before the gag order was lifted, the biotechnology industry at a San Francisco conference boldly projected that they would have 95% replacement of all commercial seeds within five years. But their fortunes were derailed by this unexpected incident which drove GMOs out of the market in Europe. And it was not the government that did it. It was the citizens saying, we don't want to eat it. And we calculated how many people in America would be required to create a tipping point here. And we think 5% because the same companies that got rid of GMOs in Europe, if they see any drop in market share in the United States, because of anti-GMO sentiment growing, it becomes the food industry sell signal that caused them all to kick it out over there. So I realized environmental books are not going to do it. I've got to go back and do another book on the health dangers 
But by this time, we had the attention of the world. There's many groups around the world, including my Institute for Responsible Technology, that was getting the word out. We had the attention, but now we needed to convince the politician and their staff and key decision makers, and they weren't reading the stories. So I wrote Genetic Roulette, which is a book that every left side of the page is a summary for the attention deficit politician. <laughs> and the right side of the detailed cited uh, text for the staff, etc. And that was out there. I mean, from an economic perspective, I certainly wasn't writing it to make money because you're writing, spending two years shepherding 30 scientists to, you know, to read everything three times and stuff to get a book out that was going to be used by activists who were going to ask to get it for free <laughs> so that they can give it to politicians. And uh, by the way, a donor has donated part of the cost of the stack of genetic roulettes in the back, so instead of being $28 or $10, and I'm doing that tonight so that you can get it out to the left brain friends of yours so that they can learn what's going on with GMOs. So this was the left brain book, whereas Seeds of Deception was the right brain book. And I started going out with genetic roulette, and it was very interesting. Around that time, I started to be invited to medical conferences. First, the naturopaths and American Academy of Environmental Medicine and ACAM and all these groups. And I realized I wasn't expecting it, but the book, Genetic Roulette, became the tool for the medical profession to get around this issue in so many instances. So when I, I went to the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, and they're a very interesting group. They're like the Sherlock Holmes detectives trying to figure out what's changing in the health in the United States and why. So their first group to discover or to identify food allergies, chemical sensitivity, Gulf War syndrome, and about 18 different problems or solutions that are now well recognized. And so I was giving them information about GMOs, and then they started doing evaluations of GMOs directly and published a policy paper on it in 2009. Now, when I was writing Genetic Roulette, I was married to the scientists in the sense that I had to accurately represent what they were saying in the kind of, well, it might and it may and it suggests and it appears. You know, if it's raining outside, they'll say, it appears that it might be raining. This is how the scientists think. And so I was gaining their trust, I had gained their trust, and I wanted to accurately represent their opinions in the literature that we were producing. And they're all about the potential for problems, the theoretical risks, and always being very, very careful not to overstate anything. But when I read the policy of the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, it was stronger than I've ever written. It was stronger than I've ever said. It was saying there's clear causal relationships between the GMOs fed to animals in laboratory experiments and things like reproductive problems, accelerated aging, organ damage, gastrointestinal problems, and dysfunctional regulation of cholesterol and insulin. They were extremely strong in their statement. And I remember talking to some of the scientists who I had been interviewing and representing, and they were a little bit nervous because it was such strong language. But there's a difference between the scientists who work theoretically and the healthcare professionals who work with people and see the results. Now, I've been invited four years in a row to the American Academy of Environmental Medicine, and I went there in 2009 after they had already published their policy in May. I saw them in November. And I brought a camera and I started interviewing them. And their statements consistently were stronger than I had ever seen. You know, the, the, allergen, the allergist was saying, I tell my patients to stay away from GMOs because they'll react to them. And they'll tell you that. And I used to test for soy allergies all the time, but now that it's genetically engineered, I just say, don't eat it, it's too dangerous. I hear another doctor saying, GMOs causes inflammation. I hear this such strong language that's different than what I was representing. And then I met Dr. Emily Lindner. And she said, I prescribe non-GMO diets to every patient, and every patient gets better. 
I went, blah, 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 what? <laughs> I was shocked. I mean, like every patient, she goes, 100%. So I said, can I come to your office and talk to your patients? She goes, yeah, we can do that. Now, it's not the only thing that she does, but her patients get better. And I was shocked at this boldness because I was dealing with the doctors that don't want to describe the weather unless they've had it documented. And so I went to her office and then also another office in Chicago from another doctor who were prescribing non-GMO diets. And sure enough, there were, we interviewed about nine or 10 patients. Remarkable recoveries, amazing recoveries. One, irritable bowel syndrome. You're supposed to take six pills a day for the rest of your life. Got on the new diet, six, four weeks later, no more pills needed. Another irritable bowel syndrome, a week and a half. 30 years of colitis, gone in three days. Skin problems, weight gain. We talked to someone who had been on their diet for 24 days. So already, ever, huge differences. The skin was clearing up. There, she was losing weight, mental fogginess. Other people, the, the morning was horrible before the change in the diet. So I started interviewing the patients in detail about, well, what did you do when you got rid of GMOs? But then a problem happened. How do you get rid of GMOs without that being mixed up with other cofactors? So one of the most popular ways that people avoid GMOs is they go to organic food. But now how do we know, let's hear it for organic, yes. <laughs> yes. And Mark Squire, by the way, was one of the people that helped bring organic standards. Thank you, Mark. Where are you? All right. Mark, you're a hero. You're a hero. So, where was I? <laughs> I was somewhere in organic land, avoiding GMOs by going to organic. Right. So, the other thing that they did was they stopped... They, eat, they ate less processed foods. Now, if you take out the processed foods, you get rid of the high fructose corn syrup, the colorings, the, uh, the preservatives. Now, some were also getting rid of gluten and dairy, and I'm thinking, I threw up my hands and go, well, there's nothing I can do with these people because it's just too many cofactors. But that same month, I started visiting veterinarians and farmers to interview them. And it turns out, when they took their livestock off of GM soy and corn, and put them on non-GM soy and corn. They didn't switch to organic. They didn't switch to non-processed foods. They weren't gluten-free cows. <laughs> and the animals were getting better. And the animal the stories now over the last two years that I'm collecting of livestock getting better from switching to non-GMO, they're amazing. OK, so we talked about the irritable bowel and the colitis, OK? That's the human side. A Danish pig farmer. Changed from GM soy to non-GM soy, and a massive problem with diarrhea disappeared in two days. Same thing, irritable bowel, diarrhea. Gastrointestinal problems described by the American Academy of Environmental Medicine. We've seen pic pictures of the pig stomachs eating GMOs, ulcered and inflamed. The same pig farmer had 36 deaths over two years prior for ulcers and bloat after switching to non-GM soy for the year, no deaths. Conception rate went up, litter size went up, antibiotic use dropped by two thirds. And that was removing GM soy. I talked to someone who removed GM corn. He's still feeding GM soy because he can't find non-GM soy. His was an interesting story. They switched to non-GM corn on the recommendation of a friend named Bill. And I, I heard about them from Bill. And Bill got a call, and the guy was stammering, and he was, hard, he was so excited, and Bill was nervous. He said, remember you told me to get rid of GMOs? And Bill was really nervous. And he said, you were not going to believe what happened. And the story started to unfold, so I talked to the farmers, and I talked to the father and the brothers. About two or three days after they switched to non-GM corn, they were walking in their nurseries with 3,000 piglets, and there was a difference so noticeable but they weren't sure what it was, and they joked, well, maybe it's that non-GM corn, and they chuckled, and they kept walking. But by day 11, it was so dramatic, they knew it was the non-GM corn. Because 14 years ago, 
one of the brothers was always kidded by his other brother because he was in charge of the nursery that he had the, the easiest job on the farm because it was so easy. And about 14 years ago, it became the hardest job on the farm because the pigs started getting sick all the time and their behavior changed. So they were injecting constantly and constantly, and they blamed it on the new genetics being brought to the area, pigs from Canada, pigs from elsewhere. But by day 11 on non-GM corn, they realized it was the GM corn all along. The diseases started going down dramatically. I've seen the chart. It's in my new film. It turns out the, uh, the behavior of the pigs changed. Before, when they were on GMOs, they'd come into the stalls and they'd, be, they'd get up quickly and they'd go around and they'd just lie down exhausted. Now they're just playing like piglets. So many farmers and so many veterinarians say specifically the animals are happier. They use that word all the time. Talk to someone who was a cattle feedlot operator with 5,000 head. He said, we didn't realize it, but the more we were feeding GM corn, the more the cattle would die. Not in the first 60 to 80 days, but then it would be one or two a week. We didn't realize it until we switched to non-GM corn. Not only did the death rate go down, but pneumonia and infectious disease dropped. And when I started to look at these differences in the animals and the categories of improvements, they were the same categories that were described by the American Academy of Environmental Medicine as the problems in the lab animals that were fed GMOs. And I, I, I'll read them to you again. Reproductive disorders, immune system problems, gastrointestinal problems, accelerated aging, organ damage. And these were the same categories of improvements that the doctors and their patients were reporting. Then I talked to a veterinary, a, veter a veterinarian who was one of the top veterinarians. He's, he writes a syndicated column that goes to 30 to 40 million readers. And he was writing at the time that GMOs were introduced. He said he got flooded with letters of dogs and cats with immune system problems and gastrointestinal problems. They were itching like crazy. They had allergies. They had diarrhea. He'd tell them, switch off GM soy and corn, and they'd get better. So we see a parallel now between the same symptoms improved in humans, in livestock, in pets, and suffered by lab, lab animals. And if you look at those, they're the same disorders that are on the rise in the US population since 1996. Inflammatory bowel disease up 40%. Ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, chronic constipation, irritable bowel, allergies, autoimmune disease, diabetes, inflammatory related diseases. So we have a situation now where I think this is the next stage of the messaging here and it actually happens to correlate with my next production which is this film which is called Genetic Roulette, The Gamble of Our Lives which comes out in about three weeks. And for there, what I did is I took these interviews from the American Academy of Environmental Medicine. I said, I've got to share this with the world. This is new stuff. No one knows this. And it took me a couple of years, and I finally, we got a little grant, and we said, okay, we'll make a little five-minute film, or maybe a 10-minute film, or maybe a 15-minute film. And I thought maybe it should just be 20 minutes, and maybe it should just be 30 minutes. And now it's 90 minutes. And... <laughs> and... <laughs> It was going to be built around these interviews that were done at their conference, and there's only about two minutes of the, of the actual conference in there. The rest is all new interviews and things. So what this seems to be, as I was reflecting, what am I going to say to this group? You were all here last year. I gave the standard genetic roulette talk. Now it's a different talk because there's new information, because now it's evolving. Before we needed to get people's attention. Then we had to get specific on the diseases that could be a problem. Now we're seeing the actual diseases get better when people get off of GMOs. So it's much more powerful much more powerful. And so what we can say to people is, just get rid of GMOs in your life for 30 days and see what happens. And I'll tell you one thing that's very scary, and that is the autism connection. Incredibly scary, and I'll explain why theoretically and also experientially. There's a Dr. Don Huber who has been doing some research related to GMOs, and he started talking about the collective experience of the livestock and the 
lab animals that are fed GMOs, and he described the behavioral changes, how they get antisocial and violent or aggressive, the changes in the gut bacteria, so that when you butcher the livestock that have been fed GMOs, it stinks and it's discolored organs compared to a completely different smell and different look for the, for the animals that have been butchered that ate non-GMO. He described the changes in the intestines. Right now, the butchers have told me that when you pull the intestines out of an animal that's been fed GMOs, they're paper thin and they rip. So you can't use sausage casings from the US. You've got to import them from New Zealand because we're destroying the intestines of our animals. So he's describing the intestinal problems, the gut permeability, the, the imbalance of the gut bacteria and the behavioral problems. And an expert in autism approached him after the talk and said, this is exactly what we're seeing in autistic children. Not only that, but it explains why I have the, the problem now that I didn't have before. When I made changes in the diet 10 years ago, we would see dramatic improvements. But now we're still feeding GMOs and the gut bacteria still has those problems and they're not getting better. So I started writing about this. I went to Autism One very recently and interviewed three parents who had taken their kids off of GMOs and all three noticed dramatic improvements in the behavior and the GI tract problems, including one of the fathers who was an oncologist and hematologist and looked very carefully and said, certainly the GMO removal was a big factor in the improvement of our son. And if you look at autism and you look at the intestinal problems, one thing that comes up a lot is leaky gut, intestinal permeability. Now, intestinal permeability is linked to allergies. It's linked to autoimmune disease, to inflammation, to Alzheimer's, to Parkinson's. What can break holes in the walls of our intestines? Do you know how Bt corn works? Bt toxin, you take genes out of soil bacteria. If you just take the soil bacteria and you spray it as a spray, it's designed to break open the stomach of insects and kill them. But they say, don't worry humans, it doesn't affect humans at all, no effect on our cells, and it's destroyed in your digestive tract. Until two months ago when they found in the Journal of Applied Toxicology, when they took Monsanto's corn and isolated the Bt toxin and exposed it to human cells, it broke holes in the cells causing leakage. And the author said, this may be the exact mechanism that it's used to kill insects. And last year, in Canada, they found the Bt toxin in 93% of the pregnant women in their bloodstream. So it not only survived digestion, it entered the blood and in 80% of their unborn fetuses. And the fetuses don't have a developed blood-brain barrier, so what happens when the Bt toxin gets in their brain? Now, Bt would probably wash out of the blood very quickly. So how come 93% of the Canadians that don't eat corn tortillas every day have Bt toxin in their blood? Well, the authors of the study suggested that it was the milk and meat of animals that do eat Bt corn every day, that it must have survived digestion in the animal, and then the protein survived digestion in the human, and then got into the bloodstream. I think there's a different explanation that might be more plausible. The only human feeding study ever published showed that part of the genes from soybeans that make the soybeans Roundup Ready transferred into the DNA of bacteria living inside our intestines. That bacteria was unkillable with Roundup. It was Roundup Ready gut bacteria suggesting that the transfer gene continued to function. If the Bt gene transfers from corn chips into our gut bacteria, it might turn it into living pesticide factories. I think that is probably why 93% of pregnant women in Canada and probably in the United States have Bt in their blood and the unborn fetuses. So if we're producing Bt toxin, which is a known allergen, which also is an irritant, which also drills holes in human cells, if we're colonizing the gut bacteria of North Americans with this, that could explain why multiple chronic illnesses in the United States practically doubled from 1996 to 2004. Why so many people are sick. 
And on top of that, this is an update for, for those of you who've been following it, there's a new organism. I mean, as if that weren't bad enough, right? There's, it's like, whew, don't tell me anymore, I gotta go. No, truly, don't leave in the middle, you'll be depressed, but wait till the end, there's good news. <laughs> but not yet. <laughs> I'm not letting you go yet, I got seven more minutes, and you're mine. Because the thing is, I still have a job to get humans up to the level of animals, and animals spontaneously avoid GMOs. We need a little nudging. So this new organism was found in high concentrations in the aborted fetal tissue of animals that were having high rates of miscarriages. So in farms and ranches, they, ran, they were having lots and lots of miscarriages or infertility, and they found this new organism that was tiny, the size of a virus, looked like a fungus. And they have since taken it out and exposed it to a pregnant chicken. It killed the embryo within 48 hours. They found it in high concentrations in feed that was sprayed with Roundup and in diseased plants where the Roundup is known to produce those diseases. And so they're looking at it, and this was all leaked on the Internet, which is why I can talk about it, in a letter to Secretary Vilsack by an incredibly credentialed man, Dr. Don Huber. Not only is he one of the world's experts at plant pathology, at the very highest level on the planet, and an expert at Roundup, he was a colonel in the military working in the intelligence agencies to guard against the outbreak of diseases, both man-made and natural. And in his letter to the Secretary of Agriculture, he said, it's an emergency, and asked one, two simple things. One, can we work together to understand it, to see what level of threat it is, and how to remediate? And two, can you hold off on Roundup Ready Alfalfa, because that'll increase the amount of Roundup used and could exacerbate a problem which is already threatening production agriculture. He was ignored on both counts. Perfect storm elements out there, just based on Roundup. So you got Roundup on one side, BT toxin on the other, and you have no one in America waking up in the morning saying, I'd like my daily dose of Roundup or BT toxin. Imagine that. So, this actually turns out, even though it's horrible and horrific to think about, right now we have so much evidence, it is so easy to change people's diet on the spot. Typically I ask an audience to rate themselves from one to 100, how vigilant you've been at avoiding GMOs, but you're from Marin, so either you're very vigilant or you're gonna lie about it. <laughs> no one wants to admit they eat GMOs in this crowd, right? And then at the end of the lecture, I say, rate yourself how vigilant you'll be next week at avoiding GMOs, and everyone changes, and we can do it very quickly. At GreenFest uh, a few months ago, I did it in 11 minutes. But I'm from New York, I can talk fast. <laughs> they don't understand me in Iowa. <laughs> That's where I live. It's been a problem. So we have a situation now where we can change someone's diet on the spot. We can get a awareness about GMOs, we can get a motivation about GMOs, and we can motivate behavior change. And if you track what's been happening over the last few years, you can see that that actually is leaking into collective consciousness and making a change. And that change is visible right here today as to why we're here. The whole labeling issue. I think that as people become aware of the problems of GMOs, a natural consequence is to want the GMOs label. Now, the voluntary labeling of non-GMO has become one of the fastest growing label claims in America for the last three or four years, and that's because of this rising collective awareness. We think it's because of the concern about the health dangers. And there's now thousands of people involved in activism and outreach, and we had to catch up by creating a tipping point network. If you'd like to join us, go to responsibletechnology.org and join the tipping point network and join with local groups in your area right now Pam has captivated them all and captured them because they're all doing ballot initiatives, you know, stuff. But it, we're, we're going to last beyond that, too. And people are learning to speak on GMOs. We've taught about 750 people. We're doing a speaker training in the East Bay on Monday night, which is just a three-hour piece before the elevator speech and also about how to talk about labeling. So that's on our website. So we're all of a sudden engaged and barely able to keep up. We had to hire a bunch of people just to focus on California way beyond our means. And by the way, we have some good news. You may have heard of Mercola.com, a very popular website 
They're very strong in the anti-GMO positioning. They're willing to give a dollar matching donation. Anyone that donates money to the Institute for Responsible Technology, they'll match it with a dollar pick towards the California ballot initiative, up to 100 grand. And even though I joke and say I'm trying to put myself out of a job, if we don't get money, I'll be doing it prematurely. So um, we have a, some envelopes in the back that you can make donations with and indicate whether it's credit card or check, et cetera. And it's very, very much needed uh, for us to even get through the election and on to the end of the year because we have realized that in order for us to be effective, we needed a lot of people, more than we could afford, and we did gamble on that. And so we're having our own gamble. Right now, the biotech industry is gambling with all of our lives. We figured we can gamble a little bit with uh, stopping them. So we've seen a change in collective consciousness. We've seen a change in the awareness right now. And, and Robin brought it out very strongly in the last 14 months, right? You started 14 months ago, what's a GMO? Now it's like everyone knows. Well, these are the early signs of a tipping point the early signs of a tipping point, and I think it's going to happen both at the ballot box and at the cash register. Now, if it does, if there is a deflation of the fortunes of genetically modified organisms in our food supply in the United States, that is a game changer around the world. Because if you read WikiLeaks, and you find the ambassador to Spain saying, I just met with the Monsanto director of the region, and we would like Washington to help the, the government of Spain to be stronger in its GMO position, or the ambassador to France saying, we should write up a retaliation list against all the countries that are trying to block GMOs and, quote, cause some pain. And you have all this, the, the USAID and the State Department and the USDA all marching lockstep with Monsanto. If we can deflate their influence on the U.S. government by causing the, the tipping point of consumer rejection with GMOs here, then we change the entire political landscape around the world. So it's an extremely leveraged action right now. The whole world into America, all of America into California, and basically California into November 6th. And, it, and right now, if you look at California, what is the region where the warriors are the strongest, where the choir is being armed to get active? That's Marin County. So I'm starting my tour here in California for Marin County. So Pam is going to talk to you about the labeling issue, which I'm going to leave for her. And I want to say this. This is an opportunity not to let slip away. Now, I'm going to give you some excuses. You can feel like you're knocked on, you know, you can be woken up in the morning, in the middle of the day, you know, 3 a.m. by your great, 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 great grandchild. How's that for, like, guilt? <laughs> Here's another way of thinking about it. When in life, when in the history of human civilization, have human beings had an opportunity to make such a positive impact? Because if you think about GMOs, as we discussed earlier, they can negatively affect all living beings, all future generations. The stated goal of the biotechnology industry was to genetically engineer 100% of all commercial seeds. Now they've added livestock. Now they've added insects. Now they've added fish. They want to replace nature, to permanently change the face of the planet, to own it, and to control it. And if they decide, well, it was a mistake after all, and the technology doesn't work, there's no recall. So if you think about the opportunity in front of us to stop this unprecedented danger, no one in history has had this opportunity to have such a positive influence on the entire planet today and all future generations. And I think we're equipped. I think we're actually sloping up right now and I've looked back in the 16 years that I've been involved in this, this is unprecedented. This is unprecedented. We've never had this much energy. 
We've never had 20 states introducing labeling bills as we did this year, illustrating, reflecting the change in collective thinking. And we've never had this much evidence about how dangerous GMOs are, so it's much easier to enlighten someone and to cause behavior change, as well as to get a vote. Now, obviously, with the votes, you don't have to go into a 40-minute speech and talk about turning your intestinal floor into living pesticide factories. You can say you're in favor of GMOs or not. You can both enjoy, you can both get behind labeling. You want to eat a GMO? Fine. You got to label it to know it's there. <laughs> That's it. Or you can simply say, you know, it's the same companies that told us Agent Orange and DDT and PCBs were safe, and they're the ones that determine if their foods are safe. You want to try it or you want to, you want to avoid it? You can't avoid it because they don't tell you. You sure you don't want to vote for Prop, for Prop 37? So there's a lot of ways to get the information out without having to be an expert, and I recommend strongly that you get the materials to create a lending library and commit now to circulate the books, the films, the pamphlets, the brochures, to become a click and send revolutionary. Because we're gonna be facing a huge disinformation campaign, multi, multi-million dollar campaign to erode our nearly three to one advantage right now in the polls. And the way that we can win is if everyone participates as a member of the network as a member of the human race, as a member of all the species that are rooting for us to win, to get this stuff labeled so people can make the right choice to avoid it, so we can all see the difference in our lives and to usher this out. So this is an opportunity that I'm so glad to be here in Marin with you, to we, so because I'm launching my personal trip through California from here, and it's like, it's, it's wonderful to be here with you again on this GMO issue, and I'm hoping that next time that I'm back, it's the victory lap. Right Thank you very much. <laughs>